The newly activated 466 Fighter Squadron had been a P-47 squadron during the last 18 months of World War II. The unit's mission was to defend the Hawaiian Islands from possible enemy attack. While the squadron never participated in combat operations, some of the pilots had fought in Europe. Others would fight the Japanese in the final months of the war in the Pacific. It was a, it was a big transition to go from the uh, C-124s to the fighters. It was like going back home from a cargo and, and troop carrier back to fighters. We had the B models to start with and we were the only organization flying that particular aircraft. I always compare the uh, F-105 to a big Cadillac. It was a huge airplane. Uh, it didn't turn hard, but it would just go faster and faster. But during that time, the reserve was truly the reserve. It was not as integrated as it is in today's Air Force. but the people who, you know, the people at that time who were the leaders in the unit uh, said, doesn't matter, we're going to train to the same requirements, the same objectives, and so if one of the combatant commanders somewhere around the world decides that they need uh, that capability, uh, the unit was ready to go. Dennis uh, was right out of pilot training and he was not an experienced fighter pilot and it was difficult for us because we weren't used to flying with somebody like that and I think all of us are concerned that we overtaxed him without even realizing it. We would take, we would, we would assume that he knew something that he didn't because we were so used to everybody knowing just the basics of flying fighters. We had uh, people from all over the world who were interested in that particular airplane uh, came to that. It was a big event. We, uh, we thought, let's, let's put together the, the ultimate thud out show. Let's get 25 of those old ancient aircraft and see if we can get them in the air in, in uh, fly formation. We flew the airplanes for the last time. And, and then, of course, we were in the F-16 business. It was brand new, leading edge technology, state of the art, and it was just an incredible rush. It was better than anything out there. The only threat at that time was the Russian bear. You know, it was the Cold War. The threat is massive, long live the threat. Well, going into the F-16, now we were picking up a real modern combat capability, and now we were, that's when we moved into part of the total force. Before, it was active duty and the also rans. And now it became more of a total force concept. During the Reagan year buildup, and as a result of that, reserve component on the air component side, the Air Force, was able to get out of old hand-me-down equipment. And both the Air Force Reserve and the Air National Guard were getting hand-me-down equipment. That went away and we got into some frontline equipment. The system reliability in the F-16 was just head and shoulders above that of the 105. And of course, its capabilities were head and shoulders above the 105. Gunsmoke 85 was also a new adventure for us. And we were new at that competition, that kind of competition. The interesting thing about it was that uh, the Gunsmoke team was all old F-105 guys. And they kind of picked out their favorite airplane and that became his airplane. As the only Air Force Reserve unit in that competition, I think that we really were striving to show everyone that we were the most experienced group there. We were really proud of ourselves and our technicians. That crew that went down to Nellis, they were just top notch. You just will never find a better crew anywhere, anytime, I don't believe. We actually got the standings back. I mean. Every day we would stand in front of the boards and watch for them to come out and update the boards because it was pretty close, actually. The winner of the F-16 Top Team Award is the 419th Tactical Fighter Wing, Hill Air Force Base, Utah. We just couldn't stop hollering. It was a great party, it was a great time, and it was awesome to come out on top like that. When Desert Storm started, Desert Shield, Desert Storm started, you know, we thought it was possible for us to go, but we had, you know, 
78 model A, a model airplanes, and uh, they weren't looking for those type of airplanes at that time. And not being able to participate was a huge disappointment for us. Um, and as a result, uh, we immediately began looking at how we could upgrade our capability so that the next time we would be able to participate. In his back seat was uh, a Captain Mike Soule, who had just got to the unit. He was an active duty captain, and it uh, just brings out that, hey, it can happen to anybody, uh, feeling uh, to all of us. We got the C model in uh, 1993. Had, all the pilots had to go down to Luke for training, and it's a significant change to the A model. Uh, the majority of the, the impact that it had was all avionics-wise and allowed us to develop into the state art fire we are today. And during that period of time, we had uh, a lot of things happen that took us from a force uh, that was a strategic reserve to the beginning steps of becoming an operational reserve. Provide Comfort was uh, the, the test bed arena for the joint operation of the different reserve units to use the same airplane, fly one set of airplanes over there and then rotate people out from the different units to fly each other's airplanes. So this was one of the first times, if not the first time, that uh, anybody, uh, active or reserve component-wise, had really put together a go to go on a real deployment and get part of your peacetime grade card filled out. The reservists, by their nature, couldn't be gone for more than, well, they didn't like to be gone more than two weeks. That was our typical deployment. We could do that with our employers. We went there, performed well, enjoyed ourselves, and got everybody home safe. It was a great opportunity. Since then, in the 90s, we've evolved into uh, a force that is probably as capable as almost any active duty unit of picking up, deploying, and fighting a war in, in almost no notice at all. We've took off-the-shelf technology uh, and capabilities that were already embedded in the F-16C and created a Block 30 precision platform uh, using initial lantern pod and then follow up the lightning pod. I was actually on final to the, to the response option target, uh, short final when they had the ROE trip and I wasn't armed up and I, I couldn't do anything. I thought, well, I'll just swing back around here and I'll be on this thing and I'll, I'll be the big dog. Uh, and before I know it, as I'm coming back around, I was coming back around from the east, all of a sudden here, show, here comes McFly and I believe he had uh, uh, Furball Furman on his wing, I'm not sure, and in they go and he drops and they both drop and do a great job. So I thought that was kind of, uh, you know, the problem with the, the, the uh, response option targets when they got an ROE trip was really trying to, trying to get through the traffic because everybody wanted to be there and everybody wanted to drop, so guys would very quickly line up. Since the lightning pod, uh, once we started dropping with that and it came back and showed the imagery, uh, the commanders over there immediately decided that this was a pretty neat toy and since then pretty much everyone's had it. The uh, lantern pod is now used primarily as a training asset at home station. 